when you try to just tack description on, it, it has a way of making you feel like they're trying to force it in. Welcome back to part two in our conversation about making energy in your story. If you have not watched part one, I recommend you do that first. It's not necessary, but it will help you. And I will link that somewhere on this video and I will also link it in the description box below. In this video, we are going to look at some examples of how writers make energy in their stories. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at how authors start their chapters. And we're going to basically look at the first several sentences of the first several chapters of a few different books so that you can compare them. The reason this is important is that when you're making energy, it's not just on a scene level. You want to think about your story as a whole. And as I mentioned in video one of this series, um, you can actually slow things down if things are not structured properly. So we're going to take a look at three. And the first one we're going to look at is Frank Herbert's Dune. And there are several things I want you to notice. I'm going to be putting text up on the screen and reading it to you. Now we'll do a few more chapters of Dune than we will the other books. And that is for a specific purpose. What I'd like for you to pay attention to is the pacing on these and the repetitive nature of how these chapters start. Dune itself is a very action-filled book and Herbert does a wonderful job of throwing you right into the action. This is um, especially commendable when you consider that Dune has a lot of backstory and it can be very easy to want to bog someone down and feel you have to bring them up to speed. I have a whole series on backstory that I will be releasing and might be released by the time this video is out. So if you're interested in backstory, take a look for that. But uh, Herbert does a good job of not just weighing you down with backstory. He lets you really get started in the story. But there is a repetitive nature to how he starts his chapters and how he writes certain things. So I want you to pay attention to, yes, his ability to throw you into the action, but how, if you can imagine reading one chapter after another, you'd get a little bit of a sense of deja vu because each one seems to want to start mildly the same way, which is very often a character introduced and thinking about something or something happening. It's a repetitive way to start. So let's go through a few of these chapters of Dune. Dune chapter one. In the week before their departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. It was a warm night at Castle Caladan, and the ancient pile of stone that had served the Atreides family as home for 26 generations bore that cool, sweat feeling it acquired before a change in the weather. The old woman was let in by the side door down the vaulted passage by Paul's room, and she was allowed a moment to peer in at him where he lay in his bed. Dune chapter 2 it was a relief globe of a world, partly in shadows, spinning under the impetus of a fat hand that glittered with rings. And then there's some setting description. An ellipsoid desk with a top of jade pink petrified lacquer wood stood at the center of the room. Veriform's suspensor chains ringed it, two of them occupied. In one sat a dark-haired youth of about sixteen years, round of face and with sullen eyes. The other held a slender, short man with an effeminate face. Both youth and man stared at the globe and the man, half hidden in shadows, spinning it. Dune Chapter 3 Well, Jessica, what have you to say for yourself? asked the Reverend Mother. It was near sunset at Castle Caladan on the day of Paul's ordeal. The two women were alone in Jessica's morning room while Paul waited in the adjoining soundproof meditation chamber. Jessica stood facing the south windows. She saw and yet did not see the evening's banked colours across meadow and river. She heard and yet did not hear the Reverend Mother's question. Dune Chapter 4 the fear her watt slipped into the training room of Castle Caladan, closed the door softly. He stood there a moment, 
feeling old and tired and storm-leathered. His left leg ached where it had been slashed once in the service of the old duke. Three generations of them now, he thought. He stared across the big room, bright with the light of noon pouring through the skylights. Saw the boy seated with back to the door, intent of papers and charts spread across an L table. Dune Chapter 5 Although he heard Dr. Yu enter the training room, noting the stiff deliberations of a man's pace, Paul remained stretched out face down on the exercise table where the masseuses had left him. He felt deliciously relaxed after the workout with Gurney Halek. You do look comfortable, said Yu in his calm, high-pitched voice. Paul raised his head, saw the man's stick figure standing several paces away, took in at a glance the wrinkled black clothing, the square block of a head with purple lips and drooping moustache, the diamond tattoo of imperial conditioning on his forehead, the long black hair caught in the Sook School's silver ring at the left shoulder. Dune Chapter 6 Paul watched his father enter the training room, saw the gourds take up stations outside. One of them closed the door. As always, Paul experienced a sense of presence in his father, someone totally here. The Duke was tall, olive-skinned. His thin face held harsh angles warmed only by deep grey eyes. He wore a black working uniform with red armorial hawk crest at breast. A silver shield belt with the patina of much use girded his narrow waist. All right, I know that's a number of them, but this is important. And one of the things I wanted you to notice on that is there's a bit of fatigue that happens with these. Uh, it's, it's like every chapter is... Frank Herbert was a journalist for part of his life, and you can feel it here. There's a very who, what, when, where, why to these openings. There's a person who's doing this for this purpose. It's very much that way. Um, going back, chapter one, in a week before the, here, you know, in a week before, so when? Um, where are we? Castle Caladan. Who is there? The old woman. And, and so it's a very, okay, who, what, when, where, why? Chapter two, same thing. Where are we? In a place with a globe and a desk. Who's there? This boy and this man and this man in the shadows. Chapter three, well, Jessica, what have you to say for yourself, said Reverend Mother? Those are the people. Where are we? S Castle Caladan. When are we there? Sunset. And, and then we get more setting when Jessica looks out the window. Chapter 4. We have the fear. What does he do? Slips in where? Training room at Castle Caladan. Um, and then we get again, he sort of does what Jessica does, where Jessica stood facing the south window and doesn't notice these things. The fear across the bright room, pouring in the skylights, notices and sees the boy. So again, repetition, repetition. And the other thing that you're dealing with is it's going back to the start. It's the old woman comes in in a passage by Paul's room. Um, and then chapter three, they're talking about Paul. Chapter four, he sees Paul. Chapter five, another entrance. Dr. Yu enters. Where does he enter the training room? Who does he notice? Paul. Then they start talking. Um, and then we get a description of character. Chapter six, who is there? Paul. Who else is there? His father. Where are they? The training room. <laughs> um, and then a description of his father. So it's just a very repetitive who, what, when, where, why. Description of scene. Description of character. A character enters. A character enters. A character enters. Um, it can make it feel repetitive. And it's one of those things that when you read Dune, you find yourself going, this feels kind of slow. And should they say, why does this feel slow? There's a lot of action happening. It's the repetitive nature of this that is slowing it down. And I'm sorry if it felt a little repetitive to listen to, but I wanted you to see how that's six chapters. And I just pulled the, I just pulled the start of them, but there, it suffers from this throughout. Uh, you don't want that. It's, I'm, I, we're looking at chapter beginnings, but I don't want you to think that the only lesson here is in the chapter beginnings. It is throughout, structurally. You want your scenes structured in different ways. Yes, scenes generally have a characters and setting component, and that's fine. But when you really read through the Dune ones, it's just, it's, it feels extremely repetitive. So the next one I want us to look at is just a few chapters from A Little Princess. Now this is a children's book, 
but it's an important one to look at because the um, the writing style is much slower paced. So Frank Herbert, his writing style was faster paced, but the structures had slowed us down. What you're going to see here is that the base level of A Little Princess is slower. So we've already got a slower base level, but you are going to also see that there are other ways that she utilizes to create that energy. A Little Princess, Chapter One. Once on a dark winter's day, when the yellow fog hung so thick and heavy in the streets of London that the lamps were lighted and the shop windows blazed with gas as they do at night, an odd-looking little girl sat in a cab with her father and was driven rather slowly through the big thoroughfares. She sat with her feet tucked under her and leaned against her father, who held her in his arms as she stared out of the window at the passing people with a queer, old-fashioned thoughtfulness in her big eyes. She was such a little girl that one did not expect to see such a look on her small face. It would have been an odd look for a child of twelve, and Sarah Crewe was only seven. The fact was, however, that she was always dreaming and thinking odd things, and could not herself remember any time when she had not been thinking things about grown-up people and the world they belonged to. She felt as if she had lived a long, long time. A Little Princess, Chapter 2 When Sarah entered the schoolroom the next morning, everybody looked at her with wide, interested eyes. By that time, every pupil, from Lavinia Herbert, who was nearly 13 and felt quite grown up, to Lottie Lay, who was only just four and the baby of the school, had heard a great deal about her. They knew very certainly that she was Miss Minchin's show pupil, and was considered a credit to the establishment. One or two of them had even caught a glimpse of her French maid Mariette, who had arrived the evening before. Lavinia had managed to pass Sarah's room where the door was open, and had seen Mariette open a box which had arrived late from some shop. It was full of petticoats with lace frills on them. Frills and frills, she whispered to her friend Jessie, as she bent over her geography. I saw her shaking them out. A Little Princess, Chapter 3 on that first morning when Sarah sat at Miss Minchin's side, aware that the whole schoolroom was devoting itself to observing her, she had noticed very soon one little girl about her own age, who looked at her very hard with a pair of light, rather dull blue eyes. She was a fat child who did not look as if she were the least clever, but she had a good-natured pouting mouth. Her flaxen hair was braided in a tight pigtail tied with a ribbon, and she had pulled this pigtail around her neck and was biting the end of the ribbon, resting her elbows on the desk as she stared wonderingly at the new pupil. When Monsieur Dufarge began to speak to Sarah, she looked a little frightened, and when Sarah stepped forward and looking at him with the innocent appealing eyes, answered him without any warning in French, the fat little girl gave a startled jump and grew quite red in her awed amazement. Having wept, Hopeless tears for weeks in her efforts to remember that la mère meant the mother and le père the father. When one spoke sensible English, it was almost too much for her to suddenly find herself listening to a child her own age who seemed not only quite familiar with these words, but apparently knew any number of others and could mix them up with verbs as if they were mere trifles. A Little Princess, Chapter 4 If Sarah had been a different kind of child, the life she led at Miss Minchin's select seminary for the next few years would not have been at all good for her. She was treated more as if she were a distinguished guest at the establishment than as if she were a mere little girl. If she had been a self-opinionated, domineering child, she might have become disagreeable enough to be unbearable through being so much indulged and flattered. If she had been an indolent child, she would have learned nothing. Privately, Miss Minchin disliked her but she was far too worldly a woman to do or say anything which might make such a desirable pupil wish to leave her school. She knew quite well that if Sarah wrote to her papa to tell him she was uncomfortable or unhappy, Captain Crewe would remove her at once. All right, so there is a lot to look at here. It's very different than Frank Herbert's Dune. Several things to note. First, the pacing of the sentences. They are longer sentences and 
they get a description very, very differently. Chapter 1. We get the same thing with the setting and the people. On a dark winter's day, and then she describes the day. And there's that a girl in her cab, and then she describes the girl. But there's a slowness to it that isn't there with Frank Herbert. And again, I'm not saying that A Little Princess is better than Dune. I like it better personally. But we're, but we're not here to say one is better. We're here to look at the, d the differences. Um, because Dune is a very popular book. Uh, but, but there's a slow description of it. She's not in a rush, the author here. On a dark winter's day, it's hung so thick and heavy in the streets of London that the lamps were lighted and the shop windows blazed. We're, we're in this, she's just letting us indulge in this setting. Herbert doesn't do that. Herbert throws you into the action. He says, here it is, and then every so often he describes something very briefly to fill it in. But you don't get the sense when you read a Herbert that he's like, just let's luxuriate a little bit in the setting the way that we do here. The other thing that happens here is that this, this time is really spent uh, describing Sarah and describing her thoughts. And it's again, it's not rushed. It's focusing in and owning that this is a description. This is the other thing that Frank Herbert does not do as much of. Once in a while, Herbert will describe something. Uh, m you see it when he describes the tutor. And I forget which chapter it is. Um, chapter five. <clears throat> where he says, Paul raised his head, saw the man's stick figure standing several paces away, took in at a glance the wrinkled black clothing, etc. He's weaving that description into Paul's action. Herbert doesn't tend to want to just sit there and say, let's just own that this is a description. He's trying to attach it to action. Again, it's fine, but it's Herbert's approach. Uh, not so with a little princess. It just says she... She was such a little girl that one did not expect that look on her face. It would have been an old look for a child of 12, but it wasn't. Um, however, she's always dreaming. She's thinking odd things, etc. It's owning the description. Now, it slows it down for sure. But notice how there's a way in which when you try to just tack description on, it... <laughs> It has a way of making you feel like they're trying to force it in. And I think Herbert does a little bit too much of this. He keeps trying to attach things on so that, um, you know, it can, I don't know, somehow maybe that makes it more legitimate to the story or keeps it more action-based. Because rather than saying, okay, pause, let's describe, it's really Paul watching and this is what Paul sees. So it's this attempt to keep the description as part of the action. It's fine, but it can make us feel like the description's not good enough on its own. When you read something the way that it's done, and you can just do too much description on its own, so I'm not saying just do that. But here in A Little Princess, when she just owns that we're in a description place, it elevates that description. It says, yes, this is worthy enough. Let's talk about it. But what this is not is high action. We are resting solidly in description and sent, uh, setting. The next chapter, when we do this, and it says when Sarah entered the schoolroom, that there's more action happening now because the first one that start is they're sitting they're sitting and we're focusing on sarah and what's in her thoughts chapter two we have a little bit more action happening and this is um there's a hustle bustle sarah enters the schoolroom everybody with wide interested eyes everybody's heard about her they've they, they know this about her, they know this about her. And so this has a building up of tension to it because they're all tense. They're like, oh, this new girl, she's, she's going to come in. Here she is, this new girl. Nobody knows anything about her. So all the characters don't know very much. Sarah's new. She doesn't know very much. There's this kind of tension level here. This sentence, this structure, like the first, is character and setting. But notice how it doesn't feel repetitive. The, the structural sort of it is different than the first chapter, and that makes it not feel so 
plodding, as with the Herbert, where we get tired of the same sentence structures. So she does a much better job here kind of creating energy by the energy of the characters. We have a little bit of dialogue, which brings in energy. There's this activity happening. And it's, it's building up for us the energy level of what's going to happen between these two, between Sarah and the school children. Chapter three slows us down a little again. So again, Herbert, every chapter feels like, go, go, go. This doesn't happen in this book. First chapter starts more setting. Second chapter starts more energy. Third chapter is a little bit in between those. It's about to get into some energy. But the third chapter actually spends a lot of time focusing on a character named Ermengarde. And she is, forgive me by the way if I'm looking down, I have the text here in front of my computer which is out of shot, but that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking down at the text. Um, by the way, if you have not liked, subscribed, and um, clicked the bell, would you please do that? It really makes such an enormous difference. It, it really does. I would appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. Um, anyway, chapter three. We've slowed things down a little bit, and um, we're focusing on Ermengarde, and we go back into character description, and we, we get this sense of who Ermengarde is. The action that happens is that Sarah, who knows French, they're in a French lesson, and Sarah opens her mouth and just drops French out like it's nothing. So there's an interesting piece of action happening, but we're actually not really focused on that. We're focused on Ermengarde. So you have this piece of action, but because we've moved the action to Ermengarde's response to it, that slowed the action down a little bit because we weren't, we didn't have our gaze singularly focused on the action itself. So all of these little things are causing, saying, okay, well, this added energy to the scene, but this dissipated it a little bit. Again, it's fine. You want both. What I want you to take away is that there are a lot of things happening in a given scene that can create and dissipate that energy. And when we just think about, oh, I'm going to write a story, we don't necessarily think about actually how much is going on. And then lastly, chapter four is, again, slowed back down um, this point to, in some ways, the action is the least of all of the chapters we've looked at in The Little Princess because at this point, it, there's no action. There's just reflection. This chapter is different in the sense that it is the most reflective, but one thing that it does fabulously is speed us through quite a bit um, because it condenses years into a paragraph. We know everything we need to know. She had a lot of praise. She had a lot of things. She had a maidservant. But we also know from this that Sarah herself was not a bad child, was a very lovely child throughout this. Um, but it also does increase the tension in some ways because we know something's going to happen and we know that Miss Minchin doesn't like her. And that is important. But we also know that Miss Minchin is afraid of her, and that is important. So we're getting set up for certain things here. But this one would be, of the four, the lowest energy because there is no action happening. It is strictly, at this point, mostly reflection on the author. All right, I hope that was helpful. Take in context. You have your job isn't to just tell me a series of events that happen. It is to create an emotional and mental response in your readers, and you do that by generating and dissipating energy, both at the conceptual level and at the word level. If you have not watched part one, again, I encourage you, go watch that because it's going to help you look at 
these. I hope this has been helpful. Again, if you have not, please do like and subscribe to this channel. And I would love to know below the books that you love and your favorite books and how you think they handle energy based on what you've learned here today. That would be lovely. I thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a fantastic day. And as always, I wish you well with your writing.